Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to outline the physiological causes of hypoxia and discuss the significance of the ventilation perfusion ratio. According to the legendary respiratory physiologist John West, there are five physiological reasons for someone to develop hypoxemia or a state of low partial pressure of oxygen in the systemic arterial blood. I constructed a mnemonic which is the acronym SAVED. It stands for SHUNT, alveolar hypoventilation, ventilation perfusion mismatch, external factors, and diffusion impairment. The first three are by far the most clinically important. Shunt is one extreme of VQ mismatch, so we'll cover those together. Instead, we'll start by just looking at ventilation. Instead of oxygen, we're gonna start with carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is constantly produced by the body in direct correlation with oxygen consumption. I discussed this in detail in my bioenergetics video. CO2 is mostly stored in the body in the form of dissolved bicarbonate, which is in equilibrium with dissolved CO2, and this rapidly forms an equilibrium with any adjacent gas. When we talk about the partial pressure of a gas in a liquid, it means the partial pressure that this uh, quantity of dissolved gas would equilibrate with. It signifies the height of the diffusion gradient, not necessarily the exact equivalent concentration you can or content. You could think of it as akin to temperature rather than heat. CO2 exists in the atmosphere at about 421 parts per million or 0.04%, which is 0.3 millimeters of mercury, which from a respiratory diffusion point of view is essentially zero, given that the normal alveolar partial pressure is 40, which is 125 times greater. Carbon dioxide easily diffuses down this steep gradient to fill the alveolus with its equivalent partial pressure. Throughout this video, I'll use a symbolic alveolus, which in this case represents the entire respiratory volume of the lung, which includes the alveolar sacs and respiratory airways from around generation 17 down, shown in red on the far left. This volume of approximately three liters is the portion of lung volume that is close enough to alveolar sacs for gas transfer to take place by diffusion. As I mentioned, diffusion takes place rapidly, so the next step is to get that air out of the lungs, which is where um, ventilation comes in. If a person's tidal volume, VT, or the amount of gas moved with each breath was 500 mils, then about 350 mils would, of this would be carbon dioxide rich alveolar gas, termed VA, and 150 mils would be the volume of the conducting zone, the so-called dead space, or VD, which is, has the same composition as humidified air. When we talk about ventilation in volume per minute in this context, we specifically mean alveolar ventilation, which is the tidal volume minus the dead space times the respiratory rate. The accent on VA means total amount of volume moved per unit time. This simple model should illustrate why less frequent larger breaths are more efficient at CO2 elimination than rapid small breaths. The body uses, uses this instinctively in Kussmaul breathing for metabolic acidosis. As your minute volume approaches dead space volume, your alveolar ventilation approaches zero. Though in practice, for smaller tidal volumes, the effective dead space decreases slightly. So a tidal volume of 150 mils will still move some carbon dioxide, but very inefficiently. The relationship between ventilation is, and CO2 is formalized in the alveolar ventilation equation, which simply states that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus or the pulmonary capillary is directly proportional to the metabolic production of CO2 and inversely proportional to the alveolar ventilation. The metabolic production term is also important for example, hypermetabolic states such as malignant hypothermia can sometimes be identified by a sudden rise in CO2. I've previously described how respiratory effort is directly controlled by central chemoreceptors in the brainstem that sense CSFPH, which is primarily influenced by the partial pressure of CO2. Because respiratory acidosis triggers an increase in ventilation, you can see through this equation how it forms a simple negative feedback circuit. We can also use this relationship to identify causes of hypoventilation. They can be broadly divided into central and peripheral. Central causes include brainstem injury or abnormalities such as Ondine's curse, central sleep apnea or severe coma, 
drugs, specifically opioids and other CNS depressants that blunt the chemoreceptor response are another cause. For peripheral causes, you can follow the effector pathway down from the brainstem to motor neurons, the neuromuscular junction, the muscle itself, musculoskeletal abnormalities such as kyphoscoliosis and other factors affecting the chest such as severe obesity. Fatigue is a major factor that can complicate other respiratory disorders, for example asthma or other causes of type 1 respiratory failure. But this is supposed to be a talk about oxygen and for that we need to look at another equation, the alveolar gas equation. We've already seen the determinants of PaCO2, so this is looking at the determinants of PaO2, specifically capital A for alveolar, as there are some reasons we'll discuss later for a difference between alveolar and arterial concentration. The F term is very minor, so I'll admit it in my slides for clarity, though I do include it in some of the calculations um, to be as accurate as possible. Anyway, let's discuss it with an example. Oxygen is 21% of dry air, but air also contains moisture. A major function of the upper respiratory tract is to warm and humidify air, which becomes 100% saturated with water at its vapor pressure. The vapor pressure of water is only determined by temperature, and at body temperature, or 37 degrees Celsius, this is 47 millimeters of mercury. At 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 760, which is atmospheric pressure at sea level. If you go to a higher altitude, the vapor pressure for a given temperature is the same, but atmospheric pressure is lower, so the boiling point falls. All of this means that we only have 713 millimeters of mercury to work with, and the inspired partial pressure of oxygen is therefore 21% of 713, which is 150 millimeters of mercury, as you can see on the left of the chart for inspired air. The first big drop in the oxygen cascade is from inspired air to alveolar gas, and that's the second part of the alveolar gas equation, bringing the partial pressure from 150 to 100, which is about 97 or 98% hemoglobin saturation. You might think of this as CO2 displacing oxygen, but it also represents oxygen being taken up from the alveolus to create a steady state. That's why you need the respiratory quotient of 0.8 for the average amount of CO2 um, produced for oxygen consumed. It should be pretty intuitive that if there's less fresh air coming in, more oxygen will be used up and replaced with CO2. The CO2 term in this case isn't the direct cause of the hypoxia, but represents global underventilation. For example, from the alveolar ventilation equation, we know that if we halve the effective ventilation, it will double the partial pressure of CO2 to 80. If we feed this into our equation now, we have a much greater drop of 100 millimeters of mercury with a PO2 of 50, which is a hypoxemic state and equates to an oxygen saturation of about 85%. We can also use the alveolar gas equation to calculate what FiO2 would be needed to correct this partial pressure of oxygen back to a normal level. We just need to make the PO2 100 and rearrange the equation to give FiO2. This gives a required FiO2 of 28%, which is a trivial amount of oxygen. We could give this with around three liters per minute via nasal prongs. Notice that the CO2 is still 80 though. To see what this is actually doing, look back at the oxygen cascade. We have just raised the PO2 of inspired air to 200, but we still have the same hypoventilation with the same large drop between inspired and alveolar O2. This is why checking SATs with supplemental oxygen can be misleading, because a small amount of additional oxygen can mask serious hypoventilation. Going back to our five causes of hypoxemia, we can divide them based on their relative effect on oxygen and carbon dioxide. For hypoventilation, we've seen that the hypoxemia can be very easily corrected, but the hypercarbia is dramatic. This is necessarily the most significant respiratory cause of hypercarbia, as PCO2 regulates ventilation in a direct negative feedback process, and it's only through failure of the ventilatory response that we see significantly elevated levels of CO2. We've looked at global alveolar ventilation. Now let's look at the core topic of this presentation, ventilation perfusion matching.
If you're like me, you will have heard people discuss VQ ratio and that they should normally match and that a shunt is a VQ ratio of zero and dead space is infinite, but didn't immediately grasp why we even talk about these concepts as a ratio. Why is ventilation on top? I got the idea for this video from a conceptual model in West's textbook and lectures. Think of the alveolus or lung unit as a vessel and of perfusion or Q as a volume of water that's added to it. Specifically, it's a unit of volume for a given unit of time. Ventilation, V, is a dye of negligible volume that's added to the vessel in terms of quantity per unit time. By definition, the VQ ratio in this example is the concentration or amount of dye per unit volume. Now imagine that we keep adding volume and amounts of dye at the same rates. The ratio will stay the same. This model in ignores diffusion, so you can think of the alveolus and pulmonary capillaries as a single well-stirred unit. Finally, if we start removing the mixture of concentration VQ, the concentration will still remain the same as we are removing both in the correct pr proportion. This is starting to resemble what happens in our lungs. It's easiest to think of the dye V as oxygen, but it also applies to carbon dioxide clearance. The VQ ratio determines the composition of alveolar gas and pulmonary and capillary blood for a given lung unit. Let's look at some examples. The easiest example is a VQ ratio of zero. There's no dye added to the water. The gas composition of blood leaving the capillary is going to be the same as the blood entering the capillary, which is the same as mixed venous blood that you'd find in the pulmonary artery. If we were to plot all possible combinations of alveolar oxygen and CO2 as partial pressures together on a graph, this would represent one extreme of our scale. The situation is known as shunt as it's functionally the same as if blood was shunted from the right heart to the left without encountering the lungs at all. You'll obviously have hypoxemia with shunt as some deoxygenated blood isn't receiving any oxygen on the way through the lungs. If you're curious, a PO2 of 40 is about equivalent to an oxygen saturation of 75%. For now, we're just focusing on partial pressure, but hemoglobin will become very important later. Shunt also completely impairs CO2 elimination for that lung unit, but as mentioned, the body can compensate for this by increasing ventilation for other lung units. Now let's add a small amount of V. This is a VQ ratio of about one third. We have some of both, but perfusion is significantly greater than ventilation. This will also cause a degree of hypoxemia and hypercarbia. It's as if too much mixed venous blood was passing through to participate completely in gas exchange. This reduced but non-zero VQ ratio is sometimes known as VQ scatter, but unlike true shunt, the associated hypoxia can be partially corrected with supplemental oxygen. We're now at the ideal midpoint, a VQ ratio of one, which gives our familiar alveolar gas composition. This is the steady state that we pictured in the alveolar ventilation section. A PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury is equivalent to a hemoglobin saturation of 97 or 98% which is certainly adequate for oxygen delivery. What happens if we keep increasing the ratio? We can do that by reducing the perfusion to an area of ventilated lung, or in theory, by just increasing total ventilation to more than what the body requires for normal gas exchange. Instead of approaching mixed venous blood, we're now moving closer to the composition of inspired air. If we keep going, we reach the other extreme, dead space. This is non-perfused lung, so the gas might as well be in the trachea. The VQ ratio and the concentration of V in our model is infinite because we assumed in the dye model that the dye doesn't take up a volume. In reality, there is a maximal composition with increasing VQ ratio, and that is the composition of inspired air. A classic example of dead space is when perfusion is completely occluded by a pulmonary embolism. But don't PEs also cause hypoxia? How does that work? As mentioned, the lung is composed of numerous lung units that all exist on a continuum of ventilation perfusion ratio. In normal lungs, there will be some degree of variation, most significantly in the vertical axis, 
but most lung units will be relatively close to a VQ ratio of 1. In lung diseases, there can be a significant deviation from this ideal. For example, in COPD, you can see a broader distribution, including a distinct population of lung units with less ventilation than needed for a given perfusion, with a ratio in the range of 0 to 1, known as VQ scatter. To discuss the effects of VQ mismatch, it's sometimes conceptually easier to simplify the lung into three possible states. Logically, these are units with VQ ratios of 0, 1 and infinity. The COPD example didn't have any shunt at all, but the units of VQ scatter could be thought of as a certain equivalent amount of true shunt with the rest of um, systemic arterial blood coming from units with equal ventilation and perfusion. VQ ratios greater than 1 do not contribute to gas exchange in this model, as dead space is equivalent to zero perfusion. So what makes shunt so special as to earn a separate mention in our five causes of hypoxia? To start, I'll mention that shunt encompasses both lung units with a VQ ratio of zero and so-called anatomical shunts, where blood actually does bypass the lungs, which happens to a tiny extent in some of the bronchial and coronary circulation, and to a much greater extent in certain forms of congenital heart disease. Together, these can be thought of as functional shunt or much more confusingly as physiological shunt. The term physiological shunt should probably be avoided as it could mean shunt as defined by physiology as used here, or shunt that happens in non-pathological situations, for example, certain anatomical shunt. The term venous admixture also refers to shunt but is sometimes used to define calculated shunt equivalent using this simplified model. Don't worry about all the terms. Shunt is just mixed venous blood that doesn't participate in gas exchange. So why is it so important for hypoxia? This is where we return to hemoglobin and the oxygen content of blood. This is the equation for the oxygen content of blood where content is in mil equivalent of gaseous oxygen at standard temperature and pressure per liter of blood Hb is functional hemoglobin content in grams per litre. SO2 is the oxyhemoglobin saturation as a decimal. And the final term is PO2 is the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen with the Henry's law constant, which is a minor contributor to oxygen content. Most oxygen in blood is bound to hemoglobin, as you can see on the graph in the bottom right. For someone with a hemoglobin concentration of 144 grams per litre or 14.4 grams per deciliter, well oxygenated blood will have an oxygen content of roughly 200 mils per litre of blood. Due to simple conservation of matter and the various equilibria, the only thing that really matters when combining differently oxygenated blood is the oxygen content, not the partial pressure or the saturation. Let's look at the output of our three simplified units. On the horizontal axis of the graph, you can see the respective partial pressures of 40, 100 and 150 millimetres of mercury. On the vertical axis, we can see the oxygen saturation of 75, 97 and 100% and the oxygen content on the left, which is conveniently the saturation times two. We want to know what the oxygen content of the final systemic arterial blood will be. We can immediately discount the dead space units because they aren't perfused. Our pulmonary embolism patient is hypoxic because they diverted blood to more lung units with a VQ ratio less than one. Imagine for simplicity in this patient that blood goes equally to the units with VQ ratios of zero and one. This could happen in a patient who's collapsed one whole lung, or if the pressure from that pulmonary embolism popped open a foramen ovale causing a right to left shunt. The oxygen content will be halfway between mixed venous, 75% times two equals 150, and normal alveolar gas, which is nearly 100%, so the final content will be just under 175 mils per liter. 175 divided by 2 is 87%, so the patient is hypoxic by oxygen saturation. What happens when we give 100% supplemental oxygen? 
on the horizontal axis, the partial pressure for the v unit with a VQ ratio of 1 has shot up to almost 700, but with only a marginal increase in oxygen content due to the dissolved oxygen because the saturation is 100%. The mixed venous is the same, so there's only a marginal increase in the final saturation from 87% to 92%, despite 100% inspired oxygen. This is essentially diagnostic of a true shunt. Any other cause of hypoxia would improve, but the inspired oxygen simply can't reach the non-ventilated lung units. You can calculate the estimated fraction of shunted blood using this equation. The term CiO2 is the oxygen content of ideal alveolar and capillary blood calculated using the alveolar gas equation and the oxygen content equation above. The CVO2 is mixed venous oxygen content, which can be calculated with measured or assumed values. Um, central venous might be a reasonable compromise if you don't have a PA catheter. And finally, CaO2 is measured arterial oxygen content. A way to think about this is that the lower term is the difference between alveolar capillary and mixed venous blood, which should be large, and the top is the difference between alveolar and systemic arterial blood, which should be very small, as shunt should be very small. As shunt increases, the arterial oxygen content will start to approach that of mixed venous blood, and the fraction will start to approach 1. In reality, as this happens, the patient's arterial saturations will initially fall towards 75%, but their mixed venous saturation will also fall as the body tries to extract what oxygen it can, so their oxygen content will instead try to approach 0, which is clinically suboptimal. The shunt equation is most useful when values are measured with an FI2 of 100%, as it will help to differentiate true shunt from milder VQ scatter. While the three unit model only considers shunt or no shunt with dead space sitting out completely, hopefully you should still be able to see why any regional disturbance in VQ ratio from 1 will worsen oxygenation. Blood from units with a VQ ratio of 1 is almost fully oxygenated, so any ventilation above 1 is a waste. The blood you didn't oxygenate will have to go and instead go to other units, which will lower their VQ ratios, and any blood going through units less than 1 can't be compensated by units with more than 1, both because the high ratio units have less blood flow and also because of the ceiling effects for oxygen content. To summarise, VQ mismatch will impair gas exchange for both oxygen and carbon dioxide, though the increased CO2 won't necessarily be evident as patients will often compensate through increased ventilation and CO2 has a more linear pressure content relationship than oxygen. True functional shunt will profoundly impair oxygenation and uniquely this will not significantly improve with supplemental oxygen. If patients are hypoxemic from shunt, their CO2 may even be low due to additional respiratory drive. Next, we have a more abstract category that you're relatively unlikely to see in a hospital at sea level. External factors essentially involve a decrease in the inhaled partial pressure of oxygen. To start, we have the oxygen cascade again, except I've gotten another step back to dry air, which is air without the saturated vapor pressure of water, as this is where our abnormality lies. If we look at the alveolar gas equation and simplify it slightly, we can see that there are two major environmental variables here, the fraction of inspired oxygen, or FiO2, and the atmospheric pressure. CO2 is still determined by ventilation and metabolism, and water is a function of body temperature only, so that doesn't change. With normal values, we get an alveolar partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury, as seen on the graph, which is an oxygen saturation of about 97-98. We frequently increase the FiO2 for patients, but there are sometimes factors that decrease it. There have been instances where medical gas supplies have been incorrectly installed, for example in a Sydney operating theatre when nitrous oxide was connected to a port labelled oxygen, leading to one death and a severe injury. You can look online and see examples of people inhaling balloons of pure helium or nitrous oxide and sometimes losing consciousness from hypoxia. Low FiO2 is more common in industrial settings, typically in so-called confined spaces. 
The generally recognized safe threshold for confined spaces is an FIA2 of 19.5%, 1.5% below normal air. As you can see, this doesn't have a dramatic effect on alveolar oxygen. The reasoning for this seems to be related to processes that can lower the ambient FIA2. The simplest one is that the oxygen has been consumed by something. Rust formation requires oxygen, so a large quantity of iron rusting in a confined space, for example a ship's anchor chain, can lower oxygen to potentially lethal levels. If you measure 18% oxygen at the entrance, you don't know it's not lower further inside. The other possibility is that a new gas has displaced the oxygen, for example methane for, from organic processes, in which case the new gas would need to compose 7% of the ambient air to reduce the oxygen to 19.5%, and you don't know if that gas is harmful in itself. It seems that 15% FiO2 is about the threshold for hypoxia for normal breathing with normal lungs. Incidentally, this concentration is sometimes used to assess whether patients will tolerate commercial air travel as it mimics the partial pressure of oxygen at cabin pressure. Our other variable is atmospheric pressure. This decreases with altitude and can be approximated with a reasonable degree of accuracy with the equation in the top right. You just multiply it by the conversion for one atmosphere, for example, 101.3 kilopascals or 760 millimeters of mercury. To start, the city of Denver in the United States has an altitude of exactly one mile and the atmospheric pressure is about 82% of sea level. This means that residents would have an alveolar PO2 of 74 rather than 100. It wouldn't cause hypoxia in its own, on its own, but it might take some getting used to. Next, we have the pressure of an airline cabin, which is typically equivalent to 8,000 feet or nearly two and a half kilometers. This is right at the threshold of hypoxia, similar to an FiO2 of 15%. You definitely notice a drop on a pulse oximeter with this, although there's probably a little bit of compensation. Next, we'll jump to over five kilometers of altitude to Mount Everest Base Camp in Nepal. Atmospheric pressure is half of that at sea level, and if we look at the alveolar gas equation, we have a PO2 of 21, which would be an oxygen saturation of 35%. Well, that's a problem. How does that work? Well, people can get altitude at sickness at base camp. It takes time to acclimatize, and one of the most important adaptations is hyperventilation. If you double your alveolar vent minute ventilation and lower your CO2 to 20, we get a more reasonable 47 millimeters of mercury of oxygen which is maybe 83% sats or a bit more with the left shift. Everest has four more camps as you ascend the mountain and takes many days to acclimatize to each increase in altitude. The final camp, four, is located at the threshold of the appropriately named death zone, above which it's impossible for humans to live for a sustained period. At eight kilometers or above, doubling your ventilation isn't going to cut it. Doubling it again just might get you to over 65% sats, and if it's good enough for a baby with severe congenital cyanotic heart disease, you may as well try to climb a mountain with it. Interestingly, the summit of Everest appears to be close to the absolute threshold for humans to survive. Even while breathing like a patient with DKA, you can only get your PO2 into the 20s. The vast majority of climbers need to use supplemental oxygen, Although one of the lowest recorded arterial PO2s in history, 19 millimeters of mercury, was measured in the death zone in the Cordwell Extreme Everest expedition. I'll link to that paper in the description. The team also demonstrated the other major factor for acclimatization. Almost all subjects became polycythemic, which maintained the oxygen content of blood at close to normal levels, at least until they got to about 7,000 meters. We cannot go higher though. In 2005, a Boeing 737 with 121 occupants flying from Greece, uh, Cyprus to Greece for Helios Airways depressurized during ascent uh, because a switch controlling the cabin pressure was accidentally left in the manual setting. The two pilots did not identify this error or utilize their oxygen masks in time and passed out. The passengers automatically received oxygen via overhead masks, but these chemical oxygen generators are only designed to last 15 to 20 minutes, which is long enough for a plane to make an emergency descent. 
Instead, the, with the pilots unconscious, the autopilot ascended to the planned altitude of 34,000 feet. As you can see, this is not compatible with life, even with significant hyperventilation. Once the oxygen generators ran out, it became a ghost flight. What difference does oxygen provide? The passenger si systems generate a flow of about six liters per minute, which in the setting of low ambient pressure can easily reach 60% FiO2 or more. This can get you out of the hypoxic range by merely doubling your alveolar ventilation, and that's enough to maintain useful consciousness. It's worth mentioning that at least one flight attendant remained conscious with the aid of an oxygen cylinder and managed to enter the cockpit, but sadly the plane ran out of fuel and crashed. Our final, our final term in the alveolar gas equation is CO2. Unfortunately, most of our models of respiratory physiology assume that the ambient CO2 concentration is negligible. As we'll see in the final section, Diffusion requires a concentration gradient, so even the transfer of highly diffusible carbon dioxide can be limited if the external carbon dioxide is elevated. This is the one situation when the ambient environment can lead to hypercapnic respiratory failure. The current atmospheric carbon dioxide level is about 400 parts per million or 0.04%, which equates to a negligible partial pressure of 0.3 millimeters of mercury. Industrial regula regulations limit eight hour exposure to carbon dioxide to about 10 times this or 0.5%, which is 3.8 millimeters of mercury and, 10 lim and limit 10 minute exposure to a more significant 3% or 23 millimeters of mercury. Outside of industry, moderate levels of ambient CO2, for example, one to 5% can be found in limestone caves. This is known in caving as foul air and can be enough to cause symptomatic hypercapnia. Another interesting situation involves closed environments that rely on carbon dioxide scrubbers to maintain breathable air. For example, anesthesia machines, rebreather dive, diving, certain submersibles and spacecraft. If the CO2 scrubbers fail, the ambient CO2 can rise to potentially deadly levels. The alveolar gas equation was not designed to model progressive hypercapnic respiratory failure, but it can tell us that an elevated arterial CO2 will correlate with the development of hypoxia when it reaches about 75 millimeters of mercury with normal inhaled oxygen, or many times higher if you have supplemental oxygen. What about massive external concentrations of CO2? Then it becomes simpler. In 1986, several hundred thousand tons of CO2 erupted from the volcanic Lake Nyos in Cameroon, causing the deaths of 1,746 people. In this case, most deaths were not from hypercapnia, but from hypoxia, as the vast quantity of CO2 was heavier than air and displaced oxygen. Similar deaths have occurred on a much smaller scale in confined spaces, often involving fermentation or dry ice. To summarize, External factors will typically cause a pure hypoxic respiratory failure, but occasionally hypercarbia if the ambient CO2 concentration is increased. Now we have our final cause for hypoxia, diffusion impairment. So far we haven't particularly mentioned diffusion abnormalities because in most circumstances, both oxygen and CO2 can adequately diffuse across a membrane to prevent respiratory failure. If you look at this figure on the left, from, again from West Respiratory Physiology, the first equation, known as Fick's law of diffusion, states that the flux or movement of gas across a membrane is directly proportional to the concentration gradient, which is the difference in partial pressures, a diffusion coefficient, and the surface area of the membrane, and is inversely proportional to the thickness of the membrane. The diffusion coefficient itself is directly proportional to the solubility of gas in the membranes, and inversely pro proportional to the square root of the molecular weight. This is known as Graham's law. CO2 has a higher diffusion coefficient than oxygen because of its solubility, despite being slightly heavier. Another important indirect factor is how quickly the medium on the other side becomes saturated with the gas, as this will eliminate the concentration gradient. For example, the gaseous anesthetic nitrous oxide is a highly diffusible gas that easily crosses the membrane and saturates capillary blood rapidly bringing the partial pressure to that of the alveolus. 
As a result, the limiting factor for diffusion of nitrous oxide is how quickly new blood can replace the saturated blood, and therefore it is considered to be perfusion limited. Carbon monoxide, on the other hand, never reaches saturation as it keeps being sucked up by haemoglobin with a high affinity. By the end of the blood vessel, there is still almost the same concentration gradient, so any limitation of diffusion needs to be due to other factors. D is a constant, so though those will be membrane thickness and surface area of the alveolar capillary interface. For example, if you thicken the membrane, less carbon monoxide will diffuse across. This is why diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide is measured as part of pulmonary function testing. Oxygen is interesting as it's primarily perfusion limited. If you look at the graph, its profile is much closer to nitrous oxide than carbon monoxide. By about a third of the way through the alveolus, the blood has reached saturation with oxygen relative to the alveolus. This redundancy means that if transit time was reduced by two thirds, for example, with increased cardiac output during exercise, you will still achieve almost complete equilibration. Oxygen can still be affected by the same diffusion limitations that, def that affect um, carbon monoxide. Typically, this involves thickening or destruction of alveolar membranes that you might see in pulmonary fibrosis or emphysema. As you can see on the graph, oxygen with abnormal diffusion is partway between perfusion and diffusion limited. Now, if you increase cardiac output and decrease transit time, there is no longer time for oxygen to equilibrate, causing hypoxia. Classically, this will produce hypoxia on exertion. The effect will further be further exaggerated by decreasing the partial pressure gradient, for example, with altitude. What about carbon dioxide? Well, CO2 diffuses out of the blood, not into it, so it can't be directly compared to the others. In terms of diffusion characteristics, it's most similar to nitrous oxide in the sense that the alveolus rapidly equilibrates with the capillary. Because this is happening in the other direction, it's actually ventilation limited, as we saw in the first section. It requires new air to replace the saturated air for further net diffusion to take place. Because of these characteristics, diffusion impairment causes a milder hypoxic respiratory failure with minimal effect on CO2. Now we have a useful schema for categorizing the causes of hypoxemia. We can subdivide them into shunt and diffusion impairment, which cause a mostly hypoxic or type one respiratory failure, and alveolar hypoventilation and non-shunt VQ mismatch, which affects both oxygen and carbon dioxide. As discussed, external factors are variable, but typically cause a pure hypoxemia. Shunt is unique as it will minimally correct with supplemental oxygen, and hypoventilation causes the most profound hypocapnia as it is failure of the normal respiratory feedback system. We can also look at the oxygen cascade to see where these factors cause hypoxemia. External factors reduce the PO2 of inspired air. Hypoventilation increases the drop to the PO2 of alveolar gas. Diffusion impairment causes a drop from alveolar to capillary PO2. True shunt causes a drop following the pulmonary capillary, though you could argue that other forms of VQ mismatch affects the alveolar gas depending which alveolus you're looking at. Hypoxia from shunt and diffusion impairment create the so-called AA difference between alveolar and arterial PO2. After that, we don't have any more causes for hypoxemia because it's defined as the partial pressure of systemic arterial oxygen being low. There are other causes of tissue hypoxia and shock, for example, anemic from impaired oxygen carriage, stagnant from inadequate circulatory delivery, or histotoxic through failed mitochondrial utilization, but these are beyond the traditional realm of the respiratory system. As mentioned, this is mostly based on the work of John West as seen in his textbook, which I'd highly recommend. I don't have any conflicts of interest, I'm just a fan. He also has a, an accompanying lecture series, which is fantastic and available for free online. If you go to my YouTube profile, I have a playlist linking to the whole 21 video series. If you want even more depth than West's book, I recommend Nunn and Lum's Applied Respiratory Physiology. Some concepts such as the three unit model are discussed there in more detail.
As usual, check out Deranged Physiology as well. Thanks for watching. I have a lot of fun making these and I wanted to get one out after my written exam. It was tough and I still don't know how I went, but I'm going back to more focus study in case I qualified for the verbal component. I'll also be moving and other things, so expect this channel to go quiet again for the next few months. Please comment or like and check out my other videos and subscribe to stay informed of the next one. Until then, bye.